<clears throat> Good morning, greetings, and welcome. I am Margaret Heisel, Senior Research Associate at the Center for Studies in Higher Education here at UC Berkeley. We have a webinar series, of which this is a, a, an important, uh, important addition to our series, and its focus is on identifying and exploring emerging trends in higher education. Today, the exploration is of how the pandemic may influence the future of internationalization in higher education throughout the world. Internationalization has, of course, many facets and contributions. It equips us to understand and adapt to an interdependent world. Jane Knight, Canadian expert, has defined internationalization as the process of integrating international, intercultural, or global dimensions into the purpose, functions, or delivery of post-secondary education. A second expert that I would mention, Barbara Hill, defined internationalization saying, globalization is the movement of people, ideas, goods, capital, services, pollution, and diseases across national borders. And internationalization is higher education's engagement with that reality. Campuses employ very different internationalization structures and the advancement of technology is also changing that structure. The format of our webinar today is hearing about internationalization's future from three highly experienced and knowledgeable experts in the field. After their presentation, we will open the session for questions, some of which you have already submitted during registration. But during the session, you will also be able to raise questions on the YouTube <laughs> chat function during the webinar, and we encourage your questions. Our first speaker, I'm going to introduce them now, is Philip Altbach. He is author, a researcher, professor, and a distinguished fellow at the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. He has received many, many awards and produced a great many scholarly publications. He has taught at Harvard. He's a faculty member at Harvard, at the University of Wisconsin, and the State University of New York at Buffalo. Our second speaker is John Lucas. John is president and CEO of ICEP, the International Student Exchange Program. He has been provost of the School of International Training, SIT, as you know, and has long experience working with partner universities. And he is the current chair of the Forum on Education Abroad Board of Directors. Great. Third is Brad Farnsworth. He is principal at Fox Hollow Advisory, which advances international learning through strategic internationalization and key partnerships. He earlier was vice president at ACE, the American Council on Education, and he was assistant vice president of the ACE Center for Internationalization and Global Engagement. He also has been director of the University of Michigan Center for International Business Education and Associate Director of the Yale China Association. And now with those introductions, I would like to begin our first speaker, Philip. It's, a, it's my pleasure uh, to be on this distinguished uh, panel and this important topic. Um, I'm gonna speak as we all are quite briefly and try to frame this discussion so that we have plenty of time for questions, answers, and interaction between uh, the panel members too. Uh, so I'm gonna be very yes, brief yes. In, in 10 minutes. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk about what I call the four C's of internationalization. And I think we've had a really good definition of what internationalization is. So we all know, we all know that. And the four C's are COVID, climate, China and commercialization. And I wanna say just a few things about each of those. My own view 
And I'd be very interested to hear both from our panelists and also from our audience. My own view is that COVID is not going to create a revolution in higher education. It's going to create some changes and it's going to maybe be particularly uh, um, problematical for a while uh, on the internationalization front. But I think the way we deal with higher education overall, research, teaching and learning, and other aspects is going to be pretty much as we've become accustomed to it for good or ill uh, over recent, uh, recent years. This is assuming, of course, that we don't have continuing COVID uh, uh, aspects go, uh, going forward. COVID is going to reduce, has already reduced mobility worldwide. And I think this is going to continue for some years, even after the COVID crisis has abated. Statistics, which we see now from uh, American, British, and some other sources, which show increases actually in, uh, in um, uh, international enrollment uh, projections. Uh, we need to keep in mind, the, this is probably, I think, um, uh, the demand which has been around for a year or two and which is now coming back into the, uh, you know, in, uh, in, into the field. So I'm not convinced that the current good news is actually good news. I think COVID will absolutely increase the use of dis distance education provision. And I think the technology has gotten a lot better, uh, partly through the misuse of it by a number of people, present company included. Um, but I think the technology has improved and it will make a difference. Uh, and probably we're talking more about hybridization. And I know one of our speakers is gonna discuss that at greater length uh, than fully online courses and degrees, although that is part of it <clears throat> as well. So I think the long-term implications of COVID are modestly minimal. Uh, and I think there are significant elements of instability in a number of areas that are going to affect higher education in the short and maybe the medium run. Let me say just a few words about climate because I think this will affect internationalization going forward. Of course, the, the full implications of the climate crisis are clear in the broader sphere, what we can expect in the coming years and decades. Uh, particularly if we don't deal constructively with, with the climate crisis. And by the way, there's not much indication that we are as we speak. Um, but uh, th there, th there will be an implication of uh, the climate crisis for internationalization going forward. Um, I think it will, there will be less short-term mobility as institutions and maybe individuals think through the climate impact of flying around the world for short periods of time. I think there will be an increase of mobility within Europe where distances are shorter. I think the impact on degree study mobility uh, will probably be not all that much affected by the climate crisis going forward. I think there will be significant changes in how we deal with international conferences and other events as we think through the climate crisis for those events. And by the way, I think all this creates problems because there's nothing like social Inter and intellectual interaction person to person. So we, uh, we need to think through these elements with great uh, care. Um, I think all of this will have a significant impact on what I might call the 
internationalization industry. Those people who are on campuses and increasingly in the private sector who are arranging for these kinds of, of uh, programs and so on, will probably need to think through branch campus issues and so on. And there might be both positive and negative aspects uh, 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 relating to that and so on. So climate is very much at the moment, slightly in the background, but I think soon to be in the foreground. Let me say just a few things about uh, China because we actually have a card carrying China expert on this panel, Brad Farnsworth. And I know he'll be speaking a little bit more about that because China is a huge player in international, uh, internationalization and international higher education in several ways. Of course, the Chinese higher education system will continue to, to grow and, at, and the top of that system will continue to improve. And already it's a major player globally. China is now a major host country, mainly for other developing parts of the world and to some extent other East Asian countries with half a million pre-COVID students in China. Uh, and of course, China's current policies relating to the management of COVID, if we might put it that way, uh, prevents students from going in or going out. And what will be the medium term and longer term impact of that is I think an interesting uh, question. Uh, there are of course, there is of course the significant disengagement of China, both caused by Chinese policies and by the policies of other countries, especially the United States, um, the disengagement of China um, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, research uh, collaboration and so on. Some of these issues are very real like internet, uh, intellectual property questions. And of course, there's been some closing of China in terms of access to information, academic freedom and so on. And that does not go unrecognized either in China, although we really don't have access to much direct information or in the rest of the world. So China is an important part of global higher education and we need to, to cope with that. And my final point is what I call the commercialization of internationalization, which is a theme which is changing the nature of internationalization in some ways. More of it is predicated on, on uh, the host countries, uh, especially the Australians and the British, less, a little bit less the Americans and the Canadians, uh, uh, and much less the continental European uh, countries, um, of looking at internationalization as what we might call a cash cow, you know, as a way of earning, uh, er, uh, earning money. So that, that's an issue. Um, the role of agents and recruiters in the mobility uh, patterns around the world is an issue. Um, the issue of branch campuses and franchise degrees, how they're handled, what is their role, what's the economics of it, and how much of, of, of those arrangements are motivated by financial considerations, mainly from the host countries. And by the way, host countries are now not only the, uh, the sort of major Western countries, but also other parts of the world too, which are developing uh, branch campuses. China has a few, the Indians are, are uh, uh, um, interested in establishing branches uh, outside of India and so on. So in summary, we're at an inflection point, I think, of internationalization with considerable uncertainties, but fundamentally, I think it's unlikely that there will be vast changes, at least in the medium run. But we do need to think how best to manage and how best to be better, more effective in planning for an internationalization future 
which is now, as I said, in a process of some change. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Philip. John? Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Philip, and it's great to, to be here speaking with Brad and Philip. Uh, Brad led the chief academic officer training when he was ace that I benefited from as a new chief academic officer. And uh, now that I, I teach uh, global higher education, a core course for the MA in um, education administration at Georgetown, and Philip, of course, we use your text, and you always do a great job of uh, laying out the issues uh, for us in the field and for our students. Um, so I lead ICEP study abroad, uh, international student exchange programs as we were called when we were founded at Georgetown University in 1979 at a time when you know, even flagship public universities and the elite private colleges lack strategic internationalization. Um, we were fully funded by the US government in our first decade of life. Um, ICEP was uh, instrumental in providing some of the infrastructure and training to kind of help build global exchanges. And since that time, ICEP uh, has grown to a membership community of over 360 colleges and universities in 60 countries, maintaining a strong commitment to our roots uh, in exchange, but with an emphasis on inclusion, access, and affordability. We have grown from being just an exchange organization to really being a strategic partner for our member institutions around the world. And our work now encompasses global exchange, study abroad, summer, internship, customized programs, and increasingly, uh, strategic support for the internationalization goals that our faculty and staff at member institutions um, may have. We also play the role of convener. We bring our members together for deep listening to one another, uh, for conversation, for collaboration, and uh, sharing of resources. So like our members, ICEP has adapted to the changing landscape of global higher education, uh, of which I think Philip is right. COVID is a part, but I see it in, in agreement as an accelerant of uh, processes that were very much underway pre-COVID uh, rather than something that is gonna radically transform the landscape of higher education. Um, despite the very real human tragedy caused by the pandemic, I would say that COVID has been a catalyst for positive change at ICEP. We've had to work faster, smarter, with fewer resources, um, and we're emerging stronger for that. I think you know, the narrative of scarcity can play out in one of two ways. Either you bring people together you know, in unity against a common challenge or you know, people get divided and we've certainly seen enough of that. I would say at ICEP, our membership community has come together. We've worked more efficiently and more effectively as a diverse community of, uh, of colleges, universities and technical schools than we really ever had. So what have we really learned, I think, from um, from COVID and where are we sort of going in you know, education abroad 2.0, if you will. Um, I think the first thing that we learned is that the promise of strategic campus internationalization that lives on the pages of many college and university strategic plans is neither as well resourced nor as well coordinated in practice. Um, the pandemic really laid bare just how disconnected the various parts of internationalization strategy are from one another. You know, so when COVID first broke out, there was a lack of coordination among say student affairs, education abroad and academic departments. Study abroad students were asked or mandated to return. They found their dormitories closed. International students may not have been able to get flights home and then they may had problems finding where to live because their dormitories were not accessible. Academic departments were not, not prepared to provide continuity of teaching. You know, that's something we've added to our emergency preparedness plan at ISEP is continuity of education. Um, I don't think we've often thought of that as a, as a component of, uh, of emergency preparedness, but it certainly is now. And so, um, you know, sometimes virtual learning was implemented in only synchronous manner. So then you had discoordination and an inability to work and reach students in far flung locations. Um, and another important point, you know, senior international officers were often hustled into cabinet meetings for consultation, but often on campuses, there's not a direct line from the SIO to the president or the provost, meaning sometimes relationships were formed or rekindled and lines of communication created kind of as the crisis was unfolding. And we saw that at ICEP by convening our members and trying to help them come up with solutions to all of these things. So if the promise of strategic internationalization is to be fulfilled, campuses are gonna to have to do better at ensuring that this vital 
part of the mission is really woven throughout the fabric of the university that all departments on campus have shared accountability. And, you know, the logistics of this have to be worked out better, you know, or as well as the philosophical and educational outcomes have been. We've got to get new lines of communication established and relationships forged. Um, I would say that, you know, I would advocate for college presidents and provosts to sit down and rethink what's the role of the, of the senior internationalization officer. If you truly have strategic internationalization as a mission, you know, education abroad, student and scholar services, um, dual and joint degrees, recruiting international students, and, you know, what your students are doing on home are not disconnected. They all need to be resourced carefully. If you have a senior internationalization officer, does she or does he have the resources and the access? Are they at the, the table in the right ways? Um, and I think that's not often the case. Um, at ICEP, what we did during the pandemic around these issues was simply to bring people together to try to share best practices and, and try to solve some of these issues. Uh, we provided training, we provided webinar, webinars and other resources, but greater communication and coordination, I think is key. And again, it's not a COVID message, but COVID really laid bare, I think some of uh, the underlying infrastructure challenges around strategic internationalization. And it certainly impacted education abroad, but its repercussions were felt really throughout the campus. Okay, so lesson number two is really about virtual learning, which I want to spend a little time about. Um, at ISEP, we quickly learned that what we as educators think of as virtual learning and what our digitally native students may want can differ quite substantially. During the pandemic, our ISEP member institutions, you know, we pivoted, we tried to offer virtual semester-based academic programs in a variety of disciplines in all kinds of formats, hybrid, uh, fully virtual, um, you know, uh, synchronous, asynchronous, et cetera. We found that students were by and large uninterested in long-term virtual mobility programs. And when we conducted a survey, students of, of over a thousand of our applicants, you know, 50% were willing to do partial remote, but if it was going to be beyond a couple of weeks, they said, you know, we'd rather just wait and do an engaged experience, you know, whether that's education abroad or, um, you know, internationalization at home, they wanted that engagement. There was, we found some receptivity to virtual internships, if there was truly an ability to engage with a host site and, um, you know, clients or staff of the uh, internship sites were robust. Now we know COIL works, um, but at ISEP we found it's not scalable. You know, students take well to the idea of, of having a course that may meet in person and then engaging with international other uh, students across the world. Um, but again, using that as a substitute for you know, mobility programs that provide um, you know, access for over a thousand students, it's, it's not gonna happen. We at ISEP have a partnership with the American Higher Education Alliance. We're creating a platform that allow teachers to come on and, and kind of match, you know, kind of like a dating uh, platform where they can find one another in their disciplines across the world. And um, so that is one way to help kind of scale. Uh, there's a platform there for them to begin building out their learning outcomes and collaborating. Uh, but I don't know that, um, that the virtual is ever going to reach the scale. Um, another, you know, kind of thing I would say along that, that line um, is that we often sometimes think that the virtual is gonna create, you know, uh, it'll be helpful for our diversity and inclusion goals. Okay, but a lot of colleges, I visit campuses all the time. I'm at Central College in Iowa now. You know, students didn't have access to the internet when the campus was shut down. People came into the parking lot. They wanted to interact with one another. They also needed access, frankly, to the internet or better access. So they would want to come to campuses. And that's, you know, one anecdote, but I've seen that and heard that from SIOs and from deans across, you know, the higher education landscape. Um, students want a living learning environment um, and they need access to the internet. And so, you know, the idea that, well, we'll just go to the virtual and that's going to solve problems and create inclusivity, I think, you know, I, I challenge that a little bit. Um, you know, further, I think we have a risk if we start to think about, you know, well, you can do virtual or, you know, an engaged learning experience in person. You can create a two-tiered or hierarchical system in which those who can will gravitate to the uh, in-person or hybrid. You know, those who don't have the resources will will only be do, able to do the virtual. I mean, in the student surveys, whatever surveys you look at will we'll back this up, I think certainly ours have and, and the research that I've done, students want the engaged. And so we need to be careful we don't end up creating a two-tiered kind of approach. Um, so I would say the idea that virtual is a replacement for engaged living learning experiences is, is a false one. I think it's a false dichotomy. I do think, and I'm interested to hear what Brad says about, uh, you know, the hybrid, um, because I think that's the vision that we're starting to see. 
The uh, future vision for education abroad isn't clear, but we can see some signposts pointing to the future. I think students will continue to benefit from deep cultural immersion that can only take place in an engaged experience. And again, I say engaged because that could be, uh, you know, internationalization at home or it could be abroad. Um, but I think students want, you know, the um, want the uh, want access to a living learning experience. Um, I see what is happening is that we all what students want is a good quality, seamless virtual experience. They don't necessarily want it to be either or. Students want to be able to uh, come in and meet an advisor for education abroad, but then they may want to have subsequent appointments online. They may want to um, be on campus and have a COIL course, but then they still might want to do a summer or a semester education abroad program. While abroad, we're now beginning to have students say to us, I'm going to be abroad, I'm going to be engaged, but there's this one course and I couldn't really come abroad if I couldn't get this course. So I'm going to take one course back with the home campus online. And, you know, um, initially there's some cringing about that. We, we, you know, those of us who are language and edu uh, educators and cross-cultural communication specialists, we want our students fully, if they're abroad, they should be engaged abroad and not constantly reconnecting back home. But the reality is by being able to take one course abroad or uh, uh, one course back at the home institution while they're abroad, that's creating opportunities for students who might not otherwise have been able to go abroad. So I see the emergence of kind of a, a seamless virtual environment in which students can move in and out of the virtual, in which courses have components and modules. And we as administrators and faculty certainly are going to have to become as comfortable as the students are with moving in and out of this kind of hybrid space that we are creating. Um, and so with that, I will um, pass the floor to Bradley. Brad? Thanks, Margaret. And, and thanks to all of you for, for signing in. It's really a pleasure to, to be here. I'm going to focus on a couple of things. One is the future of exchanges involving scholars and, and professionals. And I'm also going to say a bit more about, about China building on, on some of Phil's comments. First, on, on exchanges, a lot of what I'm going to say now is going to be building on a, a publication that I worked on when I was still at ACE called The Future of International Exchanges in a Post-COVID Context. This was funded by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation in Germany. And a lot of the data and a lot of the anecdotes in that, in that report focused on the European Union, but I think they're, the lessons are really applicable to, to the entire world. The, uh, the publication itself is, there's, there's going to be a link, uh, I guess we're on YouTube now, so the, the link will be, will be available, uh, not through chat, but through other means, and you'll be able to read that publication for, for, your, for yourself. So we, we had five chapters and I'm really gonna focus because John did such a terrific job talking about students. I'm really just gonna focus on, on, on scholars. Uh, one of the chapters really focused on what we call official exchanges or government exchanges and, and really pointed out, I think the, the very important uh, point that, that a lot of what we, we see as, as a res particularly research collaboration and all types of, of other scholarly collaboration uh, is really under the radar at our institutions. They're, they're done by individual faculty reaching out often through chance or serendipity to, to other faculty and engaging in what can be tremendously productive collaboration. Uh, I will say that this is precisely what concerns our Department of Justice here in Washington, DC, that our institutions are sort of all over the place and, and you've, you've all seen the criticisms of engagement with China in, the, in this regard, that, that we don't really have, we don't appear, and when I say we, we as uh, leaders of institutions don't appear to have a really good grasp of what's going on internationally, even in our own, in our own institutions. But, but the, the official exchanges, the Fulbright's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going on and I think there's really a lot of rich research opportunities there, looking at some of these other types of, of academic exchanges. Another key point in this, in this uh, publication was an emphasis on evaluation and the need for better metrics and, and better definitions, clear definitions of what successful programs look like. And uh, we've been living in a world where, and, and I know 
we're in a very divisive time in our country, but but we have actually seen a lot of bipartisan support for international exchanges. The government funding has actually been quite good throughout the Trump presidency, even though a lot of people were arguing that it should be shut down. One of the things that, that we argue in this publication is we're really living on borrowed time. We need to do a better job with showing the public how this, the, these exchanges work and how they contribute to the public good. Uh, it's very difficult to do. I think there, there are three, I, I don't wanna to go too much in the weeds here, but, but three angles here that I think are particularly challenging. One is showing the value added. So uh, tremendously talented people go into these international exchanges. Yes, they come out and they're very productive, but what was the value added for the international experience? How did, how did they do, develop and grow during the experience? Uh, the other one is just the unit of analysis. Are we talking, uh, are, is our focus on the growth of the individual or is it on their contribution to the institution, either the sending institution or the receiving institution? And, and finally, self-selection bias. I mean, uh, we, we've all seen it in our, in, our, in our work that the people who come to us who are the most internationally active are often people who've already had an international experience and they wanna build on that. So again, thinking about the politics of this, how do, how do we sell the entire country on the idea of, of global engagement and the importance of having an international experience. Uh, so that's the second point. The third point is diversity, tremendously important. And you are seeing three white males here today. It is still an issue in our, in our, in our field. And we are, we are as, a, as a field, responsible for doing, doing much better. One of, one of the points in the study that I thought was particularly telling is really really identifying and understanding the point of view of the first generation student. The student who has stretched financially, who's borrowed for, for their family a great deal of money, and who really feels the need to demonstrate that any experience they have as, as a student at a higher education institution contributes to their career success. And I think that uh, you know, thinking about John's remarks, the, uh, particularly the undergraduate study abroad experience, I think has come the farthest in really defining success and, and measuring success, but we, we have a long way to go. And if we're really going to, to, to diversify our field, we, we need to do a better job of explaining to underserved students and, and especially their families why an international experience is, is gonna to lead to career success. Uh, the fourth thing is, is back to this, and we're all talking about technology here. So I'll only say that all of the authors of the, the, the five chapters in this study emphasize the need for face-to-face -face communication and interaction. And uh, one chapter was on journalism exchanges. And these are mid-career people who, who step out of their lives as journalists and uh, spend a year on a university campus in the United States, sort of recharging the batteries and, and thinking about in a comparative context, how journalism is done in, in another country. Those, those people need time to recharge. They need time to reflect. And they can't do that if their virtual exchange experience is, is done through, through a computer screen. It's very important that, that phys physical mobility take place and, and to, to Phil's point, for a lengthy period of time. Uh, they really need time to disengage and, and to really think about their, their future as a journalist and, and how, they're, how they're contributing to their, to their field. I think that we, we have seen millions and millions of a tremendously smart people become very familiar with the technology that we're using right here today. And I think once we get past the sort of emergency actions that we've seen just to keep our classes running and, and, to, and, to, and to improvise over the last two years. Once we have time to take a breath, I think we're going to see an explosion of innovation uh, and using technology. But I think it will be in sort of that, that hybrid space where there still will be a physical mobility aspect to our programming, but it will be augmented and enhanced through technology, both before, during, and, and after the physical mobility experience. 
So uh, that's that's the publication. I urge you all to to take a look at it. And now I'm going to say a little bit about about China. Things are bad, and we know they're bad. And so I'm telling you something you already know. Uh, today is the 50th anniversary of Richard Nixon's visit to to China, and at, during that time, I don't think we've ever seen, possibly with the exception of the year or two after 1989, I don't think we've, we're at the lowest point in US-China relations than we've seen in, 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 my, uh, in that 50 year period. Uh, there, there are powerful forces in both countries arguing for decoupling, for, for disengagement, for, for pulling apart both in uh, business and, and culturally and um, a whole range of other things. I will say that the rhetoric in China and the actual policies and actions in China are very different. The rhetoric is truly scary. It's about us versus them. There's only gonna be one winner. This is, this is uh, life or death. If you actually look at the actions on the part of the Chinese government, it's not nearly as, as scary. Uh, for one, there is still support for scholarly engagement around the world. And this is, this is entirely pragmatic. China is, is far behind, in some cases, very far behind in the technical fields where it really wants to catch up to, to the West. The, the process of, of scholarly engagement with the US and with Europe and with other developed countries has been of tremendous benefit to China. There's a, a lot of knowledge and, and uh, intellectual property that's transferred back to China a lot of it's legal, a lot of it's not legal, but it has been, uh, for the most part, very successful for, for China. I don't think China wants to see that end anytime soon. It simply is, is, is not ready. Uh, and so uh, the restrictions that, that we are seeing, I, I think are, are, are gonna be much more, much more targeted. We're also not seeing any discussion of restricting outward mobility for Chinese students. Uh, we, we have a problem in this country remaining competitive with countries like Canada and, and the UK. Uh, but the problem is not the Chinese government. What the Chinese government would like to do is have a balanced trade, as they call it, where there are as many international students coming into China as there are Chinese students going out to other countries. That's entirely different from placing restrictions on, on outward bound Chinese students. Um, I will just say a couple more things. I think we do have a, a very serious challenge in the United States remaining competitive. I think it's, it's not just COVID, although COVID is definitely played up in the Chinese media, the way the United States has, has, has mishandled it in many ways is, is known to everybody who reads the media in, in China. Uh, there's also uh, the Chinese media also plays up the fact that there has been a lot of uh, hate crime against Asians and Asian Americans in the United States. This has families worried. This has students worried. And they're looking at other places around the world. So we have uh, a lot of a lot of work to do. Uh, one of the things I've been working on is uh, to, to engage a group of U.S. institutions to come up with a set of norms and standards for, for collaborating with China, Chinese universities, particularly within the, the research realm and, and making sure that those standards are, are, are strictly enforced so that we're all on the same page, we're all playing the, by, the same, by the same rules. Uh, you probably have all heard of the China Initiative. Uh, we, we have seen several cases where the, the prosecutions on the part of the federal government have, have fallen apart. Uh, I will just personally say, I hope, I hope the China initiative ends soon. I think we do have some problems with intellectual property theft from China, but I, I think they've been exaggerated, particularly with regard to academic collaboration. So Margaret, I think I will stop there and look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. I would like to open it up the possibility of questions among the three of you who have heard each other's presentations. What questions have raised in your mind hearing your colleagues? Oh, Philip, you're on, you're on mute. I'm sorry? Philip, Philip was, Phil was talking and he's on mute. Oh, Phil? There, yep. My humble apologies. Um, one China, one uh, reaction re relating a little bit to China, 
but also the rest of the world. Um, we do in the US still have the world's overall best higher education system. And I think despite the problems that um, Brad has mentioned, uh, and uh, he might have mentioned also the broader issue of, uh, uh, you know, of, of a fear in other countries of, uh, you know, crime and this sort of thing in the US, um, which particularly the Chinese media has been playing up, um, that we still have a very significant advantage here. And that is the quality of our higher education system. And uh, that's going to trump, not to mention Mr. Trump, um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of other things. Uh, going forward, it's certainly the case that uh, we have to up up our uh, uh, up up our game in general, um, and uh, there are these structural issues uh, in the United States, which I don't think personally are going to improve a whole lot uh, in the immediate future. Uh, but we still have certain advantages. Yeah, and I, I I I'd like to respond to that, Phil. I think it's a really important point. When I look at surveys of, of, of Chinese families in particular, there is enormous attraction to the US higher education model. And it goes beyond the US news rankings. And of course, everybody wants to have a degree from a pre prestigious institution. It, th these are families that have really looked at the model, uh, particularly the, the uh, intense interaction that can take place between faculty and students, the ability to question the professor, to be able to sort of consider multiple answers uh, to a, a, a possible problem. This is something that I think is, is universally attractive about the US system. And of course, it's not just the US, but it, uh, the US is, is, is quite good at it. At the same time, what I'm hearing from Chinese families is that you know, China has had this tremendous push for its most important universities to excel in those, those global rankings. And what that has meant is professors are spending less time teaching and more time on research. And so the problem, you, you see all this money going into the higher education system in China, you see them rising in rankings. At the same time, parents are more frustrated than ever at the quality of instruction. And, and that's pushing them outward. The only nuance I would I would add to that is um, on the exchange side, we certainly see great demand for the U.S. On the degree seeking side, uh, that's being tempered somewhat. And the thing that's, that's doing that is cost, right? And what's happened is that you know, fine institutions in in other English speaking countries, Canada, the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, etc., you know, they've learned to market themselves effectively, and their costs generally are much better. And so um, because the, the, the number of Chinese students going out for international programs is so great, the top tier universities, you know, in the United States and public universities are going to always see students from China. But those are the top tier of Chinese students. And you know, when you go a tier down, I'm hearing that South Korean universities are enrolling massive numbers of Chinese students. I mean, it's just an overwhelming number. We're not really getting down, you know, into that next tier. Um, and so I do think that there's a, a little bit of a, of a risk, um, you know, and I think for me, the cost and the cost structure of our higher education system is something that's, it's not COVID related, but it is, it is hurting us, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really important point uh, because people, you know, families and students from other countries look around to see what, what are the costs. Another issue that's slightly related is the immigration policies and post degree yes. uh, work possibilities yes. Yes. In, in different countries. And we, we saw during the Trump administration, a kind of a closing of that to some extent. And we're seeing a now significant liberalization in, the, in those areas. Uh, and we also see countries like, especially Canada, uh, Australia is, blows hot and cold on this issue, depending on, you know, local politics in the country, the British same, um, the continental European countries that we've not discussed are increasingly attractive in part because of English medium degree programs that are being offered. So this whole area of internationalization is, as I've said in my comments, much in flux and there are all these nuances of issues. And as you guys mentioned, 
you know, the, the uh, internationalization and, and the mobility patterns very much differ by the institution, especially in the US, where we have such a diversity of institutions, a little less in a lot of other countries. So it's a, it's a highly complicated environment. And those of us, obviously, all of us involved in this, in this webinar, both as speakers and as participants, need to sort of balance all these things and understand the complexities of a, of a changing uh, and highly complicated global system in which of course the United States is not the only player by any means. That's why it's so fascinating to study these things. Okay, I'm going to bring up a question now that has appeared in the chat function, which I think is important to a lot of people. <clears throat> and it says, great points about the diversity and representation in the international education field. What are some of the best diversity uh, practices about the internationalization of higher education? The other thing I'd like to add to that is I'm very curious about what you see in other countries other than the US uh, in terms of some diversity in leadership on internationalization in higher education. But I'd also really like to hear as this, as this questioner asks, have you seen any really good models for diversity in the leadership of internationalization I and its goals? I can, I brought this up, so I, I'm happy to start. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but please, I think I think we should all be answering that question. So uh, as far as models go, as, as I said in my remarks, and I touched on it really briefly, but really making the case to that first generation family that an international experience is an essential part of career success. You will be engaging as, as customers, clients, supervisors, you, you will be engaging the world outside your own country during the course of your, your career. And, and tying it to those pragmatic goals, I think is, is important. And, I'm, and I'm, I, I'm really focusing on families that are, are really struggling financially to, to pay for college. And, and we do have an, a, a very expensive higher education system in this country. So every dollar has to count. And it's not that they're gonna say it's a bad idea. They're gonna say, I need to know the return on investment for that. And, and that's, that's, that's where you need to start the conversation. The other thing I will say uh, about models is that, and this is something I've seen in the historically black colleges I worked with and, and with minority faculty generally, it, it's, it's very important for the faculty to make the case for internationalization. And when you are talking to a faculty member who looks like you, it's a much more convincing argument. And so I think a lot of this starts with the scholarly exchanges like Fulbright, making sure that they attract a very diverse group of, of scholars who then go on to teach about international topics and encourage students to get an, an international experience. I think, I think those two things working hand in hand are, 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 are really effective. Uh, I will say that the State Department and, and IAE, which administers a big chunk of the Fulbright program, they have put a lot of effort into this. I, I don't want to suggest that that no one is trying right now. They've they've tried very hard. It's just it's just it's challenging, and and the numbers have improved, but we'd all like to see them get much better. Yeah, but um, you know, if if we're asking students from uh, you know first generation families and so on to to have an international experience, we have to make that financially possible for them. I mean, yes. you have to do what Brad just said, of course, uh, to sort of convince people it's a useful expenditure of, of time and resources. But we also have to make it realistic for people to go abroad by, for example, dramatically increasing the number of Fulbright student scholarships and so on, uh, putting university money uh, into helping students do a study abroad experience and and uh, you know, and, and so on. 
some universities do that in, a, in significant ways, but they tend to be the more elite institutions. So, you know, that, that, that's an issue. Uh, the, the, the Chinese, and Brad may know the numbers, you know, a significant part of their half million international students have scholarships um, from, you know, aimed especially uh, at uh, African students, um, you know, who, you know, and, and this is kind of soft power issue, issues from the Chinese, but all countries engage in that sort of thing. Um, if you want to do a, a degree in, uh, in, in Germany, whether you're a German or a, uh, an international, there's no tuition cost. Uh, so there are things that other countries are doing um, that are pretty obvious, <laughs> would be interesting policies. Great. A couple, yeah, a couple of other things I would say on, on diversity, a couple of models. I mean, two women's colleges, I'll give an, an example. I mean, it's fundraising, right? I mean, Spelman College, which raised so much money to make education abroad available. And then Agnes Scott College, which has all the freshmen take a short, you know, um, two week program initially in their, um, in their early year, in the, in the freshman year, so that they begin to see this as part of the fabric. And everyone feels that this is something they should be, have access to all students, regardless of, of race, et cetera. I think that's great. One of the things we do at ISEP, you know, a lot of two exchanges are tuition only. You know, what does it cost to live in an American campus these days or an Australian campus or a Japanese, you know, many of the developing nations, right? So we include room and board. So students pay tuition room and board at their home and receive the same in the house. So being aware of things like that to work to equalize, I think is really important. Um, colleges that are able to do the fundraising to make the access to education abroad needs blind, you know, I mean, so in a sense, you're just uh, getting the students based on their academic experience and getting them in the right program and then funding, you know, whatever the need is that they have, but that's going to require, um, you know, an, an incredible amount of fundraising and commitment. But I think if those two small uh, women's colleges can do it, you know, uh, I, I would say that these powerful, larger institutions ought to be able to do the same. Thank you very much. I'm going to raise one more question uh, uh, brought up here on the uh, chat function. And it is, do you think that COVID will encourage proponents of international higher education to learn from the indigenous and decolonial scholarship? Well, I don't exactly know what indigenous and decolonial scholarship is. So if somebody can explain that to me, we can maybe answer the question or maybe that just reflects my own lack well, of education I, in these areas. Rather than trying to define, I'm going to ask the person who wrote this to write a definition for us, unless John or Brad have anything they would like to contribute. No, I'd, I'd also like to learn more. Yeah. yeah I, I, well, I won't give a definition, but I, I can talk about, you know, these other ways of knowing, you know, for example, I, I was at the University of, Reg of Regina, which is a member, and they have uh, the First Nations University as part of them. And so I was talking to, to a professor about why more Indigenous students don't go abroad. And they said, well, look, you know, we teach a course on science and one of the, there's reticence among some of the populations. Well, this is kind of the, you know, a white approach to things. So we bring the elders into the classroom and they tell stories. And oftentimes then the, the biology professor can then say, we well, you know this story relates to what we're saying scientifically in, in this manner. So it's finding other ways of knowing. And I think that the point there is, finding the people who can speak the language, right? And, you know, and so, and then bringing those other ways of knowing into our classroom so that it isn't sort of like, you know, and then, and Brad mentioned it too, you know, who are the people promoting education abroad? It's the faculty being diverse and then our own staff. If the, if the people who are speaking to you are, you know, white and you're speaking to people of color, you know, there's a cultural shift there. So someone from that culture who understands and can really um, articulate another way of knowing and um, I think it's really important. Students seem to see themselves in the experience, but I, I wouldn't want to attempt a, a, a definition because the anthropologists and sociologists would do a better job of that. I just add one thing to that. And, and that is in, you know, back to the publication I, I introduced at the beginning of my remarks. One of the things that, that we found in this study is that professional st school students really have a different attitude towards study abroad versus undergraduates. And they tend to really be focused much more on themes, 
global challenges as opposed to a destination. So it's not about I going to Germany. It's it's about I need to understand the development of electric vehicles in a global context. And Germany is a really important place for that. China is a more is is a very important place for that. And so I'm going to study this this global challenge. And that that's the way you get professional school students. And I, and I think that that could also transfer to a lot of other topics as well, where it's, it's not, I'm going to go to Germany and I'm going to learn German, but I really under, need to understand the indigenous experience all over the world, or I need to understand the, uh, the Jewish diaspora. And to do that, I need to go to th three or four different countries. And so okay. it's that co comparative learning experience that I think is, is, is very rich and very promising. Yeah, and I think it's, I agree with that. And it's myth busting too. you know, the idea that, you know, yeah, science has to be studied in Germany. Well, what about going and doing, you know, an environmental science program in Ghana, at, you know, an outstanding research university, which is the University of Ghana, or, you know, in Morocco, we have some um, outstanding engineering schools, Koreans are exchanging with, um, with uh, the Moroccans, our Korean technical universities in greater numbers than the US, because, you know, it's just understanding that different, you know, it doesn't have to be a Western culture that uh, is the only place where science or certain types of knowledge lives. It's just understanding that um, there's value in other ways of knowing and kind of breaking down some of those myths, I think is really, but I think it is starting to happen. Well, and it does seem that internships abroad is one of the places where students can really learn. Uh, a they acquire a type of knowledge that's very useful for them for commercial activities later. I think that's very good. Okay, we only have four minutes. Could I ask one more quick question? And that is, sure. that is that my feeling is that the best internationalization programs I've seen have usually been uh, put together with a strategic plan. And I'm wondering, if you have seen any strategic strategic plans that are particularly strong and that campuses have measured very well the degree to which they are able to achieve those goals that they set in that plan. I guess that's a hard question, but maybe quickly, if you've seen any good models. Well, Brad is probably the expert on that having worked. I can, I can start. Because as many of you know, the AC is well known for its internationalization laboratory. AC has a number of model strategic plans on, on its website. And if I, I haven't looked at that recently, I, I left AC over a year ago, but if it, it, it should still be there. If it's not, let me know and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll help you find it. I will say, Margaret, it's very important to distinguish between a really good strategic plan and then metrics and for, for, for implementation. I think that's, that's those are that's two radically I different. Know, <laughs> yeah. And I can't tell you, Phil, you know, Phil's nodding. You know, I can't, we've all seen these gorgeous, eloquent strategic plans that never get implemented. Uh, it's all about being realistic and being accountable. And that's that's where so many of them fall down. Uh -huh. Totally agree. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, now we're down to three minutes, but I think the person who, uh, let's see, on destination, no, that's it. On destinations, no, not yet a higher level if we read open doors. The top destinations are still in Western Europe. That being said, faculty diversity had led to a greater diversity of designations in faculty-led study abroad. And through the exchange model, we are seeing increases in diversity of destinations. Okay. Yeah. I think with that, because we are right at the end, uh, I will thank the three of you very, very much for the illumination of this field. Very, very helpful. And I think it's very important for 